So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We have people joining us from different regions around the globe. Welcome and thank you for attending this roundtable. My name is Annette Bohr. I'm an Associate Fellow of the Russia Eurasia Program at Chatham House. And it's my pleasure to moderate this session, which is on an important topic that we don't discuss enough. In fact, this is the first time that Chatham House is holding a roundtable discussion, virtual or otherwise, on gender equality and LGBT plus issues in Central Asia. So with the collapse of the USSR and the partial condemnation of the Soviet project came efforts to replace Marxist ideals in Central Asia with nationalist ones that emphasize traditional gender roles. Within this post-Soviet framework, gender equality is often presented as a threat to existing patriarchal traditions and new state initiatives have appeared for the purpose of reinforcing gender stereotypes while targeting LGBT plus activism. But at the same time as retraditionalization has experienced an upsurge, feminism in Central Asia has begun to gain momentum. So the region has been witnessing a rise in activism that has manifested itself not only in protests, but in conferences, theaters, songs, academic debates, contemporary art. And you can now find bloggers in Central Asia writing on all manner of gender equality issues with much greater visibility. And as we speak, an online festival based in Almaty devoted to tackling feminism, gender inequality, LGBT plus discrimination and domestic and sexual violence has been underway and it involves lawyers, activists, academics from across the region. However, the backlash has been substantial. Uh, at the Feminali Feminist Art Exhibition that took place in Kyrgyzstan in 2019, the Ministry of Culture ordered the removal of several pieces. Nationalist groups crashed the exhibit hall demanding that the government shut down the event. To name one more example, in Bishkek in Women's Day this year, uh, women holding a, a march came under attack by a mob of men throwing eggs and dragging participants to the ground. And there have been many other such incidents. So in order to bring together these conflicting currents, we pulled together a stellar group of panelists, I'm happy to say, based in Almaty, Bishkek in New York. We'll start with Colleen Wood, who's written for The Diplomat on various aspects of gender equality in Central Asia. Colleen has spent two years in Kyrgyzstan and is a fluent Kyrgyz speaker. And her work has been funded by the National Science Foundation and the Harriman Institute. Colleen will contextualize gender equality in Central Asia for us and point to some key developments. Then I'm going to move on to Dina Smailova, a well-known activist, many of you have heard of her, I'm sure. She works for justice for the survivors of domestic and sexual violence. She leads the Speak Out movement, Nimol Chi, that started a public dialogue on sexual violence and is providing free legal support to survivors. She will be discussing efforts to see the passage in parliament of stronger laws in Kazakhstan, and there have been some very interesting developments in very recent days on this. And it is her group that is precisely the group that is one of the main engine behind these events. Now, Dina will present in Russian with simultaneous translation. If you need translation, please select the English channel in the translation tube on Zoom. Для тех, кто хочет слушать всю дискуссию по-русски, выберите русский язык в разделе перевод. If you have any technical difficulties, please send a private message to Anna Morgan via the chat function. Um, our final speaker is Mahira Suyarkulova, an associate professor at the American University of Central Asia. Mahira is a Bishkek-based researcher, a feminist, and an LGBT plus activist. And in, in, in addition to giving us her thoughts on the general retraditionalization process that has been underway in the region and how this affects gender equality, she'll offer comments on the current state of play with regard to LGBT, LGBT plus rights in Central Asia. Each speaker will have approximately 10 minutes to speak, after which we'll move to the Q&A part of the session. Today's event is being held on the record. So with that, I'm going to now cede the floor to Colleen. Good morning from New York, everyone. Uh, I'm so excited to see such a great audience. 
So to get the roundtable going, I have two goals that I hope will then foster productive conversation in the Q&A portion. First, I want to contextualize gender equality in Central Asia and to discuss the ways that patriarchy is institutionalized and experienced in Central Asian countries. Second, I want to get a sense of women's activism in Central Asia and make the case that it's important to look beyond mobilization just on women's issues. So first, how is patriarchy institutionalized in Central Asia? I think it goes without saying that patriarchy is a pervasive force globally and as well in Central Asia. Uh, domestic violence, sexual violence is widespread in the region and women are beaten, kidnapped and raped with impunity. Individual cases have become flashpoints in recent years to raise attention, as with the murder of Burulai Turdala Kazu in spring 2018 in Kyrgyzstan, or the rape of a woman on a train in Kazakhstan in the summer of 2019. But unfortunately, the vast, vast majority of women who suffer from domestic and sexual violence do not have their story told. I think part of this is that survey data in the region finds that men and many women don't see sexual and domestic violence as a problem that needs solving. Like domestic violence feeds on social norms and weak enforcement of laws in the cases where they exist, but other features of political and economic structures in Central Asian countries exacerbate the situation. This includes education imbalances, where, for example, in Tajikistan, just 64% of girls end up making the jump from lower to upper secondary education, and also economic security imbalances between men and women. In the informal economies of the region, it is often women who suffer more from uh, economic precarity and economic in uh, insecurity. And I think it's tempting to point to a lack of representation in government as an explanation for the lack of policy solutions to these issues. But I think what that misses is actually that gender quotas are quite common in the region and that representation in national parliament and local councils is actually similar to levels in countries like the United States. Uh, we see numbers of women in national and national parliament and local councils rising across the region. For example, in Uzbekistan, parliamentary elections earlier this year saw the number of women in the Majlis jump from 24 to 48. In Tajikistan, uh, the proportion of women in parliament has grown from just 3% in 1995 to 24% in the 2020 elections earlier this year. Having these huge jumps, though, in representation relies heavily on gender quotas. And these, as we know from broader global social science research, are not a perfect fix. Like the way that these institutions end up getting written gives the appearance of boosting women's participation, but actually in practice, there are many loopholes. For example, in Kyrgyzstan, the quota is for candidate lists, not actual seats in parliament. So even though you end up with the party list submitting 30% of their candidates as women, the number of women who actually serve in parliament is much lower. Moreover, social science research tells us that quotas mean more women in power, which later changes how people perceive women's effectiveness as leaders. So over time, you end up with more, uh, more empowerment and um, better social norms around gender. But for example, in Tajikistan, women end up getting told that politics is a male space. And even with these quotas and even with this institutional support, women still struggle with discrimination getting access to funding and press coverage and other factors that are necessary for success as a politician, not just a seat at the table. So having given a very, very high level view of high politics uh, in, in the region and how that, relates to, um, how that relates to women's experiences, I now want to shift um, and look at how organization and mobilization looks like. So if we have this picture of high politics and in many cases, the lip service given to difficult gender disparities on the ground. What then are women doing about it? What does mobilization look like? Um, and I think certainly we see explicitly feminist activism. Um, women are carrying out information campaigns, political campaigns against sexual violence. They are advocating vigorously for the adoption of laws on domestic violence and sexual harassment. Um, and I think one thing that I've been following closely in my research is that with the pandemic forcing people indoors, um, even in Tajikistan, where officials denied that the country was dealing with the virus for several months, we've seen a fine tuning of digital strategies for activism and an explosion of creativity. So, for example, in Uzbekistan in July of this year, 
women organized a Facebook flash mob with posters that, for example, read, uh, a housewife or a daughter-in-law doesn't make me um, a servant. We also have in Tajikistan a, a growing space on Instagram for bloggers writing about feminism and gender equality. An article that I wrote with Sher Hashimov that came out yesterday in the Calvert Journal explores how both young men and women are building and follow, are building large followings and starting these difficult conversations about misogyny. Um, we also see in Kyrgyzstan, sex education Instagram accounts are trying to broadcast information about reproductive and sexual health to young people. And all of this flourishing is largely focused on trying to empower young women by giving them information and access to power. But I want to end on a on one point is that women are not only mobilizing on quote unquote women's issues, that women are also major drivers in broad civic education and mobilization movements. Um, for example, in February 2019, dozens of mothers organized protests in Kazakhstan's capital after five children died in a house fire. The protesters demanded that the government provide better benefits for mothers with several children, and mothers continued organizing protests throughout 2019. Uh, I think that these should be read as a serious challenge to the state's failure to follow through on its social contract and not just an instance of women trying to uh, get access to economic and social benefits because they are women. Women are at the center of organizing social activism in Kazakhstan. They are on the front lines of protests for justice and accountability. They are creatively navigating digital and analog forms of mobilization. They are taking advantage of formal government channels to hold authorities accountable and taking only a narrow look and focusing on the ways that women carry out campaigns directly related to their own subjugation misses the bigger picture of, of their power and their activism in the region. So I'm looking forward to hearing the other speakers and definitely to the Q&A afterwards. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Colleen. Certainly kept within your time limits. And um, in, in terms of your referring to women in power, I thought it was very interesting that you did make note that a lot of this is reliant on gender quotas. Um, one little known fact that I think is rather interesting to pull up is that the country in the world with the largest number of women in parliament is not France, it's not United Kingdom, not America, it's Rwanda. Um, and of course, this is for the purposes of gaining external funding money. Many of these women have views that are antithetical to gender equality. So there's a lot to be discussed there. Thank you very much. Now we're going to move on to uh, uh, Dina Smailova. For those of you who want to hear, uh, you can press your interpretation button to hear in either language. Dina, on to you. Здравствуйте, уважаемые коллеги. Меня зовут Дина Смаилова, я лидер движения против насилия над женщинами и детьми, президент общественного фонда «Не молчи кейзе». Исторически так сложилось, что движение «Не молчи» начало свой путь с моего открытого заявления в социальных сетях о том, что в юности я пережила групповое изнасилование. Я призвала женщин не молчать о насилии и вместо, вместе открыто бороться с этим злом. С первых дней появления хэштега «Не молчи кейзе» Мне, как человеку новому в этой э, области, большую поддержку оказала общественность Казахстана. Благодаря поддержке простых людей, международных экспертов, журналистов, я выбрала тот путь развития организации, к которой мы сейчас идем. Общественный фонд «Немолчик язык» — это организация, которая до сегодняшнего дня не имеет финансирования, работает на энтузиазме. Все, что делается нашим движением, делается силами волонтеров бесплатно. Финансовую помощь нам оказывают подписчики из социальных сетей. Наша работа ведется публично и открыто. Тем самым мы меняем отношение общества к жертвам насилия и теме насилия как таковой. Делаем ее видимой и вовлекаем общественность в обсуждение данных тем. Мы помогаем жертвам насилия, предоставляя бесплатную юридическую и психологическую помощь. Помогаем решить социальные проблемы. За время существования организации мы оказали помощь тысячам жертвам насилия в некоторых уголовных делах, сами защищали потерпевших по доверенности в судах и следствии как общественных представителей. Благодаря нашему участию сегодня 55 насильников и педофилов осуждены на длительные сроки. Правовое положение женщин в Казахстане оставляет желать лучшего. 
А основная часть казахстанских законов, регулирующих права женщин, по мнению национальных экспертов, не полностью соответствует или в ряде случаев противоречит международным договорам и конвенциям, к которым страна присоединилась или ратифицировала. Юристы и правозащитники считают, что национальное законодательство Республики Казахстан должно быть приведено в соответствие с ратифицированными международными правовыми документами, в том числе в отношении женщин. Пока эта работа парламентом в полном объеме не проделана, что отрицательно сказывается на реализации женщинами своих прав, свобод и обязанностей. С учетом проведенного за последние годы анализа законодательства и практики, хотелось бы осветить отдельные проблемные вопросы. Во время карантина повсеместно отмечается резкий рост случаев бытового насилия. В нашей стране на 25%. После введения во многих государствах мер, связанных с пандемией коронавируса, мир столкнулся со вспышкой домашнего насилия. И у нас карантин стал серьезным испытанием для общества. Самоизоляция негативно повлияла на психоэмоциональное состояние отдельных граждан, не говоря уже о семьях, где и раньше имели место факты насилия. Тем не менее, дело не только в карантине. Уровень насильственной преступности, совершенной в семейной бытовой сфере, не только остается стабильно высоким в Казахстане, но и в целом имеет тенденцию к росту. За 7 месяцев текущего года количество правонарушений в семейной бытовой сфере увеличилось на 21%. Наш фонд практически в течение 4 лет не перестает шокировать казахстанскую общественность вопиющими фактами насилия над женщинами и детьми. Если в 2016 году выйти в СМИ и заявить на всю страну, что женщины или ребенок были изнасилованы и просят помощи общественности, было стыдно и таких фактов единицы, то сейчас насильники, педофилы, домашние агрессоры точно знают, что любая женщина пойдет в СМИ, и он и его семья будут опозорены прилюдно. Благодаря женской солидарности в этих вопросах, поддержке казахстанских международных СМИ, Уровень сексуального насилия за пять лет значительно сократился. Если посмотреть на статистику, то в 2015 году было зарегистрировано 3637 преступлений против половой неприкосновенности личности, то в 2019 их уже было 1332 за год. Одним из вопиющих случаев сексуального насилия это дело по изнасилованию пассажирки поезда Тальго в 2019 году, когда судья вынес двум проводникам, срок по два с половиной года тюрьмы. Общественность была настолько возмущена, что дело пересмотрели и проводников приговорили уже к пяти годам лишения свободы каждого. Дина, извините, mm -hmm. можно чуть-чуть медленнее читать? Не надо так быстро. Спасибо большое вам. Хорошо, спасибо. На фоне общественного резонанса в 2019 году Президент Казахстана Касым Жумар Тукаев поручил правительству разработать законы, защищающие права женщин и детей. С января 2020 года вступил в силу закон об ужесточении наказаний за сексуальное насилие, где изнасилования переведены в состав тяжких преступлений и увеличены сроки наказания. За год количество заявлений по преступлению против половой неприкосновенности женщин снизилось на 30%. В 2020 году за 7 месяцев зарегистрировано 429 преступлений. Несомненно, на это повлияло усиление наказания. Это остудило голову многих потенциальных насильников. Раньше он мог примириться с жертвой и тем самым избежать реального наказания. Это позволило бы ему оставаться на свободе, и, возможно, насилие бы могло повториться. И даже если бы он был наказан, то сроки наказания в среднем были два с половиной, три года лишения свободы. Сейчас эта возможность исключена. К примеру, в этом году за такие преступления в среднем осуждают на пять с половиной лет лишения свободы. Но есть еще ряд серьезных нерешенных проблем правоприменительной практики. Из 31 дела общественного фонда «Не молчи, дети» КИЗ по изнасилованию детей и подростков за период с 2016 по 2019 год 16 девочек, подростков и два мальчика совершили попытку суицида. Две девочки погибло, им было по 15 лет. Одна осталась инвалидом, ей было 16, когда она сбросилась с девятого этажа, не выдержав следственных мероприятий и недоверия взрослых. 
две девочки буквально сошли с ума во время следствия. Одной было 6 лет, она сразу попала в психиатрическую больницу, пролежала 10 дней, там смогли восстановить ее психику. А второй пришлось пролежать почти два месяца. Хочу обратить внимание на статистику. В стране подверглись преступлениям против половой неприкосновенности 550 детей с января по август этого года. Сколько же среди них подростков? Есть риск, что половина из них совершат попытку суицида, не выдержав следственных мероприятий. Сейчас в парламенте Республики Казахстан рассматривается не менее важный для страны закон о противодействии семейно-бытовому насилию. Я благодарна, что меня пригласили в рабочую группу, и мы имеем возможность принимать активное участие в разработке нового закона. Мы провели полгода активной плодотворной работы над законом о бытовом насилии, и 22 сентября депутаты парламента Республики Казахстан приняли закон в первом чтении. Несмотря на то, что закон принят в первом чтении, есть некое противостояние госорганов, депутаты и общественники настаивают на криминализации побоев. Но пока этот вопрос остается на рассмотрении парламента и правительства. Разработанными депутатами законопроекта предусматривается упорядочивание правовых механизмов реализации государственной политики в области противодействия семейно-бытовому насилию. Предлагается ужесточить наказание для семейных агрессоров, если свидетелями домашнего насилия становятся несовершеннолетние дети. Для усиления защиты пострадавших депутаты предложили норму, согласно которой полицейский вправе самостоятельно принимать решение о вынесении защитного предписания. То есть независимо от мнения потерпевших к виновным в бытовом насилии могут быть применены требования к поведению. В настоящее время защитное предписание с перечным требованием к поведению правонарушителя выносится только по просьбе потерпевшего лица. Предлагается вести 30-дневный запрет на контакты и общение с пострадавшими и детьми, на встречи с ними и их преследования, которое может выноситься как по фактам бытового насилия, так и по результатам идентификации такой угрозы. Статистика МВДРК показывает, что 130 тысяч обращений в полицию поступило за 2020 год. А к административной ответственности привлечены всего 30 тысяч, уголовные 2,5 тысячи человек. Остальные остались безнаказанными. Женщины вынуждены терпеть насилие, забирая заявление, потому что через три часа после профилактической беседы агрессор возвращается домой, и если она снова вызовет полицию, у нее есть все шансы быть искалеченной и убитой. По данным исследования структуры ООН «Женщины», в Казахстане ежегодно погибают 400 женщин в семейно-бытовых конфликтах. Остро стоит вопрос о пересмотре работы кризисных центров которые, конечно, нужны, но то, как они сейчас работают, это вредительство стране и так уязвимому положению женщин. Матери приходят в центр за помощью, а сталкиваются со строгой дисциплиной, казарменными условиями проживания. Некоторые наши подзащитные называют кризисные центры женской колонии режимным объектом. Но у них нет выбора, потому что пока закон позволяет, не позволяет выселять агрессора, в итоге он остается в совместном жилье, а женщина с детьми вынуждена скрываться и терпеть массу проблем. В то время как с агрессором практически не ведется никакая работа. Новый законопроект предусматривает обязательную психокоррекцию агрессора и привлечение к общественным работам. До сих пор не принят закон о сексуальном харассменте. В настоящее время в стране женщины не могут защитить себя от мужского домогательства законом. Поэтому общественный фонд «Немолчи Кизет» неоднократно обращался в парламент с целью создания в законодательстве статьи домогательства. Насилие начинается с домогательства. Следующий шаг – насилие, а потом может быть убийство. Это три ступени, которыми, над которыми общество должно задуматься. Кроме этого, есть проблемы с точными данными по совершенным фактом насилия. Статистика не показывает полный анализ. Нет отдельного анализа Министерства здравоохранения. Общественники требуют не скрывать от общественности масштабы насилия. Нет отчета от неправительственных и государственных структур о распределении и финансировании на борьбу с насилием. Это самая больная тема нашей страны, но мы ее прикрываем какими-то бесполезными, дорогими грантовыми программами, которые реальной помощи не несут. 
одни и те же НПО ежегодно получают до миллиарда тенге в год на помощь жертвам насилия, но никто не посмотрел на эффективность вложенных средств. Почему организация «Не молчи» из, из четырех человек зашла на поле НПО и изменила ситуацию в стране за четыре года без финансирования и грантов? За четыре года мы научили общество не молчать о насилии, Законодательно ужесточены наказания за сексуальное насилие, за педофилию, теперь и за бытовое насилие. Мы показали новый формат борьбы с насилием, менее затратный, но быстрый и эффективный. Поэтому мы требуем цифры, не просто сухой материал о звонках и количестве защитных предписаний. Пока нет анализа, статистики, нет данных от Минздрава, нет исследований, мы не можем понимать масштабы проблемы. Недавно мы обращались к главе Министерства общественного развития и информации с просьбой взять на контроль реализацию социальных рекламных проектов, вступление публичных лиц с большой аудиторией на предмет подачи материалов. В последнее время мы наблюдаем массовую пропаганду насилия над женщинами, красиво завуалированную в упаковку под названием «Семейные традиции национальной ценности». Такая пропаганда опасна. Мы живем в светском правом государстве. Женщины и мужчины защищены Конституцией Республики Казахстан и наделены равными правами. 5 июля 2020 года в Казахстане впервые были введены гендерные квоты для партийных списков. Согласно закону, в стране вводятся квоты в размере не менее 30% для лиц, не достигших 29-летнего возраста, и женщин от общего числа, включенных в список лиц для регистрации кандидатов в депутаты от одной политической партии. Мы очень рады, что ситуация в стране глобально меняется, что руководство страны, правительство и депутаты обратили внимание на проблему семейно-бытового насилия в стране, гендерное равенство, и сейчас тема обсуждается на всех уровнях. Только объединив усилия, мы сможем решить эту проблему. Большое спасибо. Wonderful, Dina. Thank you very much. There's a lot there as well to discuss in our upcoming Q&A. And next we move on to Mahira Surakula. Mahira. And hello and welcome to all the members of the audience. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? Yeah. Um, I'll try not to speak too fast to allow the interpreter to do her work. Um, uh, so I was asked to... Uh, talk um, about retraditionalization and LGBTQ plus uh, rights in Central Asia. Um, and the, this suggests in itself that uh, tradition and uh, queer existence are somehow at odds that they are in conflict. So um, in my uh, intervention today, I would like to kind of unpack this concept of um, retraditionalization uh, and to problematize the discourse that juxtaposes LGBTQ rights uh, and lives with tradition. And to consider when and how traditions uh, change and what that means for LGBTQ people and uh, LGBTQ movement in Central Asia. So, uh, yeah, so uh, I would like to uh, politicize this idea of retraditionalization because uh, usually uh, tradition is presented or uh, it's believed to have some kind of agency of its own, um, the way we usually um, talk about it in our everyday uh, discourses as if as if it just happens, uh, kind of like weather. Um, but uh, I, in, I would like to use uh, the definition of tradition as practice that was um, proposed by uh, Judith Bayer and Peter Finke in a recent uh, special issue of Central Asian Survey Journal um, on practices of traditionalization in Central Asia where they um, uh, treat it as, um, you know, speech or performative acts. So whenever somebody designates something as traditional, um, that in itself, uh, you know, is, uh, it's, it's a, um, a speech or performative act. Um, and so um, 
Tradition uh, is usually invoked in two ways. Uh, as a kind of a deficiency to be overcome, yeah, within the modernity project, or as a quality to be embraced, yeah, within the nationalist, traditionalist project. So, um, yeah, so I would like us to kind of think um, and ask uh, questions about this, uh, uh, these processes that we call traditionalization or retraditionalization. Uh, so what we should really be uh, focusing on is um, the practical ways in which tradition is put to use, by whom, to what ends, who has the authority uh, to define what is traditional, authentic, and proper, uh, what uh, subject positions become possible or are maintained through these discourses of tradition and practices of traditionalization, so yeah, so uh, when uh, when we again uh, connect that to the matter of LGBTQ uh, rights and existence in the region, uh, then uh, yeah, this um, idea of uh, uh, traditionalization, uh, you know, being in conflict with uh, queer life, uh, queer life. Uh, comes into play. Um, so uh, it's kind of like this new Cold War narrative almost um, where uh, homosexuality is associated with the West and heterosexuality uh, with the East. And um, uh, it is fair to say that, for instance, in Central Asian states, there is a, a lot of like this echoing of what's happening in Russia, for instance. Uh, so, you know, uh, laws are copied, uh, rhetoric is, is repeated. Um, but we should also remember that uh, this Russian discourse of traditionalization, and which is homophobic, um, is itself part of a global uh, right-wing conservative and nationalist rhetoric. Uh, you know, all this uh, opposition to so-called gender ideology, uh, uh, defense of uh, traditional and family values um, against this existential threat of feminism and LGBTQ movement. Um, it, 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 is, um, it is very much, uh, yeah, part of, of that global discourse. Um, we know for sure that uh, uh, these organizations that uh, um, push this agenda through various international organizations and uh, platforms. Um, they are in contact with uh, politicians in uh, Central Asia, in Kyrgyzstan for sure. So for instance, the, the, the conservative pastor who uh, was uh, uh, pushing through um, a homophobic bill in Uganda uh, also worked with uh, with Russian uh, anti-LGBT homophobic activists uh, to push through the propaganda law. And the same uh, person came to Kyrgyzstan and also worked with local politicians. Uh, so it, it, it's, uh, it's not a conspiracy theory. It's a, an actual kind of process globally that is taking place and it's well documented and researched um, that, uh, that is happening. So yeah, so uh, I, I kind of wanted to problematize this uh, very uh, facile uh, depiction of, you know, kind of uh, homophobic East versus the homophilic West. And, uh, uh, but it is, <laughs> yeah, it is very much uh, part of the uh, local discourse that, you know, all this uh, queerness, it's originating from outside. It's advanced as some kind of uh, nefarious agenda that is um, bound to destroy our nation. Um, so uh, this is being used, um, you know, to uh, kind of uh, uh, advance uh, certain policy changes, for instance, changes to the constitution. Uh, in Kyrgyzstan, there was a propaganda draft law uh, which was uh, also being pushed through uh, the parliament along with the sister bill um, against um, uh, so-called foreign agents. Um, 
so we, we see this as a kind of general uh, part of a general assault on civil society and freedom of peaceful assembly. Uh, so uh, Feminali has been mentioned already, the, what happened on the 8th of March this year also. But we also see in that, for instance, in Kyrgyzstan with elections coming up, um, you know, this association with uh, uh, LGBTQ uh, agenda uh, is being used uh, to tar the uh, political opponents, right? To discredit them. Um, they're being painted as uh, being kind of in solidarity uh, with um, queer people. Uh, but yeah, like recently, uh, LGBT um, uh, plat platform of Central Asia made a, a public statement. They really uh, um, published a press release where they said that we are not um, supporting any political party and we actually against this kind of um, uh, manipulative use of um, our lives and our existence for political purposes because no political party is actually representing us. None of them are um, proposing policies that would benefit us. Um, so uh, finally, uh, I wanted to think about um, when and, and how does tradition change? Uh, so uh, it's, it's uh, um, quite uh, visible that you know, this process is taking place that we're calling retraditionalization or traditionalization. <laughs> so what we actually observe in the post-Soviet um, period is, uh, yeah, so traditions change when relative positions and bargaining power of different actors change, right? So Alton Kapalo, for instance, did a study of informal financial networks, um, uh, which uh, she argues arose as a response to demolition of the welfare state and growing inequality and vulnerability. So uh, people participate in this kind of informal um, uh, kind of safety net uh, arrangements uh, because they can't count on, you know, uh, any kind of uh, social solidarity systems to help them out. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, similarly, uh, Christine Gotzi in her book, Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism uh, and Other Arguments in Favor of uh, Economic Equality, uh, she, um, she describes how this retraditionalization and re-familiarization of women happened uh, after socialism uh, at the service of new liberal capitalism because it's, it's you know, it's, uh, it, uh, it advances a certain also economic agenda. So, um, yeah, so uh, to conclude, I, I think um, we, uh, we should uh, seek to um, advance not only, you know, gender equality agenda, not only LGBTQ rights agenda, but we should also uh, be focusing very much on uh, general issues of social justice, uh, solidarity, and uh, economic equality. Without it, um, there will be no change in tradition. And also uh, from kind of the ideological side, yeah, from, from, uh, we should uh, think of other set of traditions, yeah, a different. So when, for instance, feminists or queer people um, uh, build their movement, uh, there is a different set of traditions that we can be referring to, yeah, in, the, in our historical heritage. So there's a actual very rich history of women's movement and achievements uh, in the past. Uh, there is obviously a queer history which is being written. Um, it still has to be written. Um, and that's what uh, we are working on. We are writing our own history and we're offering this alternative narrative. Um, so uh, I'll finish here and I'm looking forward to the discussion and the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mahira, for some very original points, particularly on the way that tradition changes. Um, so we're going to move over to the Q&A 
now. And if you would like to ask a question, please either type it in the chat section, mentioning the name of the speaker you are addressing your question to, or use the raised hand function in the participant, the participant section on Zoom. All of the meeting guests are muted for the duration of the event, so we will unmute those who wish to ask their questions live. And we are recording this event and might release it in full or in part on, your, on our YouTube channel, so if you're asking your question live, you will appear on the recording. Um, and just to let you know, we'll soon be hosting another event related to the topic of today's discussion on domestic violence in Russia and Central and Eastern Europe. And you can find details of this on the chat, should you like to register. Um, so I'll take questions. Um, I'd like to first pose a question to Mohira. Um, you mentioned the supposed homophilic West and the homophobic East. And there are certainly many voices who cite the influence of Russian media in Central Asia as having helped to cultivate a negative attitude towards feminism, towards LGBT+, by presenting it as a dangerous Western intrusion, dangerous Western influence, uh, without wanting to make this a, a simple dichotomy. Would you say that there is some truth to that nonetheless? Yeah, thank you for the question. So uh, definitely, as, as I said, there is this influence. Uh, I, uh, I'm not in any way denying it i'm just saying that uh, uh it's not yeah it's not just uh, that simple it's actually part of a global movement so russia itself is part of uh you know uh, this uh conservative uh, right-wing discourse um uh yeah so uh the, the, <laughs> they are also communicating with um you know forces uh from the united states from uh you know, global south, you know, so it's like this uh, unholy alliance of conservative forces from Muslim countries, from, you know, uh, uh, Roman Catholic Church, uh, and all kinds of like conservative forces, uh, they're working very well together internationally um, to advance this kind of uh, um, traditional values uh, agenda that is anti-feminist and anti-LGBTQ. Right, so... Alex Folks has asked the following question. To what extent is the drop in the number of rape and other sexual assault cases registered by the police due to an actual cut in the amount of sexual violence, or could it be due to an unwillingness to report such assaults or by the police to register cases? I think this is a good question to address to Dina, but of course, please feel free to jump in if you have anything to say, Colleen or Mahira. Есть, конечно, факты, когда э, женщины не хотят сообщать о сексуальном насилии в силу, э, испы, испы, испытывая стыд, страх, испытывая чувство вины, потому что, как правило, общество винит жертву в том, что она была изнасилована. Э, из э, чувства вот, вот нашей ментальности восточной, что казахская женщина, она должна быть чистой, неприкосновенной, выйти замуж девственницей, и поэтому рассказать о том, что ты была изнасилована, значит признать, что ты уже не чистая, и ты грязная, и ты не девственница, и ты уже как испорченный продукт. Это вот такова ментальность мышления нашего сообщества. Если говорить о, о цифрах, то порядка только 10% женщин идут в полицию и заявляют о том, что произошло сексуальное насилие. И, к сожалению, только 10% реально заявленных фактов доходит до приговора суда. Так как мы работаем непосредственно с жертвами насилия, мы видим, что в тюрьмы садятся всего лишь 10% от тех заявлений, которые поступают в полицию. And I think I would just want to add to that as well, that this question that it frames, is this uh, actually a drop in cases or is there something going on with the way that the data is collected and analyzed? I think Dina said something really important during her initial presentation that we just, we really have a lack of quality data about these experiences. And I think part of that is a capacity question and part of that is an unwillingness on the part of state organs, but also um, at the micro level, the relations between women and police officers or women and their family members, there's a lot of incentives away from actually going through the entire process of reporting. 
think that the, a case from this summer in Jalalabad Oblast in Kyrgyzstan illustrates this really well. It was the, the woman whose husband filmed, had it filmed that he was beating her in a really, really horrific way. And she did go to the police. She did try to report it. And three days later, retracted her um, her charges. And it's not it's unclear because she's gone silent whether that was she retracted because of police pressure, because of pressure from her husband's family or from her own. Um, but I think that the, the drop in cases that there definitely is still an issue with this kind of micro uh, local level pressures uh, on women and on police officers to encourage people to to not follow through or go all of the way in a really complicated process to report this and to get that data collected. Thank, thank you, Colleen. Uh, hence the very appropriate name of Dina's movement, Speak Out. Um, and Dina, on that note, you mentioned in your presentation that 400 women currently die each year in Kazakhstan. Uh, do any of the panelists have any idea what that figure is for other Central Asian states? Do you have any further information on that, Dina, or Mahira, or Colleen? I wouldn't be able to give a, a number, uh, but I agree that we do have a, a major issue with um, how statistics are kept, and uh, uh, if anybody is actually interested in uh, collecting the data, and uh, and yeah, so uh, this there's always uh, this um, issue of underreporting. So, yeah, a uh, cause of death may not be recorded as what it was. So. Okay, th thank you, Mohira. Um, another question from Mohira. Thank you very much for the interesting presentation from Laura Luciani. Could you provide some concrete examples of how queer activists in Central Asia are building or could build agendas that are intersectional and include ideals of social justice and solidarity. And how could foreign donors support these agendas without fostering suspicions of LGBT equality as a foreign agenda meant to destroy national traditions? So uh, concrete examples of uh, intersectional um, work is, uh, for instance, uh, the 8th of March, uh, March, um, when, uh, Every year, it's a very diverse group of uh, women representing different communities who work together to create this event. And uh, and uh, we publish sort of a, a manifesto every year, which is very heavily, you know, uh, focusing on socioeconomic equality issues. And every year, though, yeah, uh, these manifestos are being ignored by the press and uh, everybody else. And uh, they just focus on, you know, is there a rainbow flag or, you know, are the queers part of that? Um, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, for instance, when we were um, uh, contesting the ban to march this year in the courts, at the same time, uh, uh, trade unions were also contesting uh, this ban. Yeah, so they were also being... Uh, prohibited from um, organizing peaceful gatherings and uh, yeah, uh, exercising their constitutional right to uh, peaceful assembly. So uh, there's definitely uh, a lot of uh, intersections and uh, there are, I don't know, like uh, coalitions that are um, being built, um, but uh, definitely with LGBTQ activism there is a, a, a stigma uh, that a lot of uh, political groups uh, are not willing to uh, solidarize yeah, with. So it's, it's kind of like uh, our coalitions tend to be with other similarly m marginalized and stigmatized groups. Um, and uh, the other half of the question, I, I can't recall. Could someone re remind me? Um, it's it's how can foreign donors support uh, these agendas without fostering suspicions of LGBT equality as a foreign agenda meant to destroy national traditions? Uh, yeah, I don't I don't know if <laughs> there is a yeah there is a way to to do that. Uh, if um, yeah, I mean uh, definitely we are trying, for instance, to organize the march 
without any uh, support from uh, anybody else. And the same was with Feminale. Yeah, it was it was uh, uh, important to raise money through other means and be independent. Uh, I mean, originally it it it, it wasn't hundred percent by design. Um, we did uh, apply for some support from international organizations and they actually uh, refused us um, because they uh, thought we were too radical. So they are already self-censoring themselves. Uh, they are quite anxious not to uh, appear as, uh, um, uh, you know, support this uh, more kind of <laughs> um, radical uh, 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 women groups um, and agendas. So uh, I don't know uh, what to answer actually to this question. Sorry. Um, okay. Okay. Then I'll move on to a question from Juliet Clouseau. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Have there been any discussions in the parliaments of Central Asian republics about prohibiting gender ideology or any project of recriminalization or criminalization of homosexuality? So that, that's a very interesting question. If this has actually been raised at the level of parliament, we know from Dina that there have been many discussions on legislation regarding domestic and sexual violence. But what about the criminalization of homosexuality uh, or the prohibiting of gender ideology altogether? Perhaps we can, I don't know, shall we start with uh, Dina and then move on to either Colleen or Mahira? Мы под... Спасибо за вопрос. Таких запретов в парламенту у нас мы не наблюдали, но рабочая группа, которая работала в парламенте над законом, предлагала официально внести в закон поправки о том, чтобы не было пропаганды вот, вот подобных, скажем, реклам, рекламных роликов, фильмов, которые дискриминируют права женщин, либо призывают к насилию над женщинами. У нас на, на днях, ну, в, в то время, когда мы обсуждали закон, в социальных сетях вышел рекламный ролик, социальный ролик о, о роли женщины. И женщину, которая была в короткой юбке и ну, открытом топике, назвали проституткой, судя по тому, как она была одета. И в этом ролике обыкновенный таксист нравоучал, обучал эту девушку, как правильно одеваться, чтобы не выглядеть проституткой и все такое. Этот ролик вызвал огромное возмущение общественности, что женщина за то, что одета в короткую юбку, может быть подвергнута вот такому сравнению. И мы попросили вот на фоне вот этого резонанса, вся рабочая группа была, была настроена решительно, мы попросили внести законопроект, ну, поправки, касающиеся этой темы. К сожалению, эти поправки не одобрили, и вообще парламент с, большим, с большой осторожностью от, ну, отнесся к любому произношению, где идет словосочетание на, на национальные традиции, национальные ценности. Они всячески хотели увести эту тему от обсуждения, чтобы только это нигде никуда не попало в законопроект. К сожалению, мы не смогли это, но мы добиться. Thank, thank you, Dina. But with regard to discussions of this at the parliamentary level, we know that after the adoption of the anti-gay legislation in Russia, this did then move on to Kyrgyzstan, where it was passed once, twice, and then suspended, and it's currently shelved with the, under the new administration. And in Kazakhstan, it, it didn't pass at all. I don't know of any, any such similar attempts in, in any of the other Central Asian states. So. So it, it actually got further in Russia than it did in Central Asia. Um, Colleen, do you have anything uh, to add on this topic? Yeah, I just, uh, the question frames, um, like is there a discussion in parliament about recriminalizing homosexuality? And I think that it's an important time to remind that in Uzbekistan, homosexuality is still illegal. It was never uh, decriminalized or never um, made legal, which, it doesn't appear to be a priority on Mirziyoyev's reform platform. Um, there doesn't seem to be a big push, but um, I think it's really shameful. And there have been uh, several flashpoint cases um, in the last year, last last summer, the murder of a man who had just come out on social media. And I think um, the impunity of the police to not really get involved and not investigate that case further um, shows that even if there is or is not a discussion or um, 
like legitimation of um, anti-LGBT views in parliament, if it's not made law that this is illegal, that um, the police officers and um, like the law enforcement arm of society is kind of like acting uh, with, it, with its own authority there. And I think um, that the case of the Mar March 8th March in Kyrgyzstan is a great example of that, that it, it didn't need to be illegal for um, women and queer activists in Kyrgyzstan to be organizing on this issue. But the fact that the police and vigilantes in masks were allowed to attack these people who had gathered peacefully and that in the end, the people who were punished for it were the women who had organized the march shows that you don't need to have laws on the table for the de facto state to be that homosexuality, queer views and radical feminism are not tolerated and not allowed. So I think if anything, the more dangerous thing is the fact that there is not discussion of this at the parliamentary or the formal institutional level um, that that gap is um, where a lot of the, the danger and the violence comes in. Yeah, very well put. Thank you, Colleen. Yes, my understanding is that the 8th March um, demonstration led to 70 women being held for many, many hours and only three of the attackers were held. So that's quite an interesting point. And do you correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding that homosexuality is only criminalized in Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. So while Uzbekistan is busy putting women in parliament, it somehow hasn't got round to decriminalizing homosexuality. Um, and so actually for women, it's a bit easier in Uzbekistan because it's only male uh, homosexuality that is in fact criminal. So I don't know if anyone has any information, if there's any progress on, on this or, or we're at a standstill, but um, not heard much about it. Um, I have a raised hand here uh, by Anvar Latipov, so we will call on him now. So if you could unmute yourself, Anvar, we'd love to hear from you. Um, hi, um, I just wanted to add to what Colleen said earlier about the police in Uzbekistan. Um, most of the time, police in Uzbekistan is actually um, are the ones who lure people on online dating apps and then blackmail them for money. So this has been, there has been a lot of cases that targeted LGBT community by the police themselves. And the killing of uh, the young man who came out online, um, a lot of people think that was also done by people in power, not by, by the lover of a person that the state uh, stated later. Uh, my question is actually for, um, uh, sorry <laughs> if I may ask a question. Uh, uh, my question is for Mohira Suyarkulova. Um, we have we see a lot of times when um, Western countries uh, talk uh, about LGBT rights in Russia, how it's bad, and they, uh, which is you know, which is a fair point, and they like you know show solidarity in their embassies. Uh, but why don't they do the same thing in Central Asia? I don't see like. Uh, UK's embassy or United States embassy uh, putting up a, f uh, a rainbow flag like they do in Russia or like they do in Azerbaijan. Uh, but the, um, you know, like uh, also like uh, about reforms in Uzbekistan, why don't the Western countries uh, pressure Central Asian governments to do better for LGBT rights? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anwar. Uh, I think it's also. Uh, um the matter of the current uh, presidency in the United States, uh, uh, specifically if we talk about the US policies in the region, uh, there has been definitely um, uh, a retreat, yeah, uh, in, <laughs> in, in American uh, official discourse from uh, advocating LGBTQ rights. Uh, it, it was even removed, I think, on the day day one of Trump presidency, they removed all mention of LGBTQ issues from the White House website. Um, and yeah, so uh, definitely uh, this has affected. And uh, we, we also see the, the rise of uh, right-wing politics uh, across Western Europe. Um, and I think, like I said, there's this degree of self-censorship that is happening, right? Like they don't they don't want to be suspected of advancing LGBTQ agenda or feminist agenda, so they just refrain from um, pushing uh, these issues. Um, 
And uh, yeah, so uh, just kind of to uh, go back to the previous discussion, because I was I was one of the 70 women who were detained on the 8th of March in, in Bishkek, and I was fined uh, for disobeying, uh, quote unquote, uh, lawful re uh, requests of police. Uh, uh, yeah, like uh, here, uh, it's not even that, you know, some anonymous masked man uh, representing uh, the, this uh, uh, so-called tradition uh, attacked us uh, uh, and the police didn't defend us. It was very obvious that this was orchestrated by the police, uh, that uh, the people who attacked us were probably, uh, you know, just plain clothes. Uh, police uh, people or people associated with the police or some authorities. Uh, so, <laughs> and this was not the first time this happened. Yeah. So, uh, uh, this also happened last year on the first of May when we was just we were just gathering for a picnic in in, in a park. Uh, so we were also attacked back then, and police also behaved in the very same way. So. Uh, yeah, like uh, like like you said, uh, there doesn't need to be uh, a law uh, that criminalizing be that criminalizes be, being LGBTQ uh, for uh, for this ideology to work this way. Yeah, it's already uh, practiced and uh, kind of semi institutionalized in, in the way uh, the uh, state structures work. Uh, and I also. Um, uh, like with regard to this uh, draft propaganda law that uh, was never passed, but it still affected again uh, the lives of LGBTQ people. So anecdotal evidence suggests that there was a rise of uh, violence against LGBTQ people after this uh, law was proposed. So uh, yeah, like and, and even in my own uh, home institution where I work, uh, 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 like a, an informal conversation with a colleague uh, kind of uh, demonstrated to me that even though there is no law against propaganda, I was being told that, um, you know, teaching certain issues at the university is inappropriate because it's propaganda. Yeah. Um, so people are already uh, practicing this and uh, uh, instituting it in their daily lives and, um, and work, uh, even though it's not an official law. Yeah, thank you for that, Mahira. Very important point that, that the law certainly is not the most determinate factor and that in fact, although the law was not passed in Kyrgyzstan, ultimately there was that rise in anti-LGBT um, activity. I just want to make sure before moving on to the next question that neither Colleen nor Dima, uh, Dina has anything to add on this particular topic. Okay, well, there's a comment from Mat Yasevovich that in Uzbekistan, the number of international lawyers and human rights specialists were contacted by the Ministry of Justice to discuss the abolition of anti-homosexuality law and replace it with anti-gay laws similar to Russian federal laws. So apparently we have had some activity in that sphere in Uzbekistan that I had not heard about. So thank you for that comment. Moving on to a uh, rather longer question by Dilmara Yusupov, uh, and this is to any of the panelists. Thank you so much for the interesting talk. I would like to ask Mohira about traditions retraditionalization. Seeing the emergence of the feminist movement in Central Asia, you can say that there's a specific, or can you say that there is a specific context-based feminism, which is different from such movements that emerged in the Western countries. For instance, I heard one lawyer saying gender justice rather than gender equality in the context of Uzbekistan. This is an interesting question because despite everything that we hear from Russia, they actually have a very long tradition of gender studies there, for example. So yes, so we'll, we'll start first with Mahira. Thank you. Uh, so if I understand uh, correctly, uh, the question is um, if there is a uh, something specific about feminism in Central Asia that uh, sets it apart from other feminisms in the region? Did I understand that correctly? Uh, yeah, the, yes, I, I suppose that is what she's acting, or a, a way in which feminism has emerged in Central Asia that is different from how it has emerged in Western countries. Hmm. Uh, 
Well, yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, it, it has its uh, roots in, in uh, uh, Soviet uh, promise of emancipation of women, which had its very uh, specific nature in Central Asia, right, with uh, this emancipation of the woman of the East as a special category of a woman that needs to be emancipated, um, which, of course, yeah, uh, was uh, quite problematic in, in so many ways. Um, uh, and and uh, yeah, so we, we, we can't talk of, of the same kind of history uh, of, you know, the three waves uh, that uh, were happening in, in the West. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, I think it's, it's still um, kind of a legacy that uh, we can work with, with all its contradictions and, and problematic uh, nature. And um, ambivalence, yeah, also with regard to, for instance, LGBTQ um, uh, uh, history. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's what I was, um, that was what I meant when I was talking about like creating, referring to a different set of traditions, right? Um, and uh, writing and rewriting history uh, in the way that. Uh, yeah, takes into account our existence and uh, um, in a way valorizes and glorifies it, uh, something that we can be proud of. So for one, one example uh, for me, for instance, would be we have this project uh, here, uh, the satellite, the first Kyrgyz satellite uh, that, uh, you know, young women are, are building um, uh, to kind of uh, counter the harmful gender stereotypes about women in science and technology. Uh, but we can, we can also uh, think of this as a continuation of a legacy of, uh, you know, space research and exploration that existed in Soviet Union, of Valentina Tereshkova, of how Kyrgyzstan was actually part, and other Central Asian states were actually part of this, uh, you know, uh, Soviet Union efforts uh, of, say, of space research. Uh, so it, when the first Sputnik was launched in 60s, it was our Sputnik as well. It wasn't somebody else's Sputnik. Yeah, um, uh, our countries also contributed to this. Um, so we are part of this uh, great history. And women were, of course, part of that. And, you know, uh, queer people were also part of that. Um, so, yeah, uh, I, I hope I managed to answer it somehow. Okay, well, we have uh, Dilma Yusupov who would like to clarify the question, but for that, I think you'd need to raise your hand and, and we can, or we can, <laughs> we can unmute you if you want to unmute yourself and, and clarify the question, Dilma Yes, We're uh, happy yeah. to do that. So thank you very much, uh, Mohira. And um, I just wanted to clarify the question. Um, so um, I, I can um, understand that there is a huge legacy uh, of the Soviet legacy of emancipation of women and the history uh, of in, in, in the Soviet kind of the influence of the Soviet legacy, but also there is an emergence kind of emergence. I can ask, I can I say emergence of Islam and um, kind of revival of it, the culture and I can see this tension between uh, feminism and like conservative male uh, representatives of uh, kind of religious people saying that, um, I mean, the question was about the applicability of- Excuse me, Dimura, just one yeah. second. We, we have our yeah. simultaneous uh, interpreter yeah. translating into the wrong channel. So I just want to say, Irina, apparently you are translating Russian into the English channel. So if that could be got moved over to the Russian channel, that would be great. Okay, sorry. Um, yes, yes. So my question was about like, I'm, I'm a disability act activist and researcher and, and uh, many people say that those human rights based approach models, uh, which were developed in the West, for example, they will not be applicable in the context of uh, Central Asian countries. And then Central Asian countries should have their own specific kind of um, disability movement or feminist movement. So they say that it should be different because we cannot translate or um, kind of all the feminist movement uh, like and apply it directly as it is in, in Uzbekistan or in, in other countries. So I was, my question was about the applicability of the feminist movement and its values in the context of Central Asian countries. 
And to whom would you like to address that, Dumaraj? To, to everyone. <laughs> okay, <laughs> who like, Colleen, Dina, who would uh, like, Colleen, yeah. let's go with, let's start with Colleen then. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, hearing this, like, rearticulation of the question makes me think back to Mojira's original opening statement that, um, like, what we lose by putting tradition against queerness or tradition against feminism. Um, and I think it's a, a trend that I've seen in pop culture and in Instagram culture, uh, in, Kyrgyz in Kyrgyzstan at least in the last year, is a lot of young women realizing that they don't need to frame their feminism as counter to tradition and a reclaiming of symbols a reclaiming of language. Like I think um, it would have been common two, three years ago for music and for um, art to be written and shared in Russian. Uh, uh, like, uh, and now we see more and more Kyrgyz language and in Kazakhstan too, Kazakh language materials that are using traditional um, artistic symbols, traditional clothing to get across their message. And I think that this is powerful for a handful of reasons, but it's especially because it's a fact that what you're asking of like, is there a Central Asian specific context here? Is that women and organizers know that there is and are recognizing the power in those symbols and are reclaiming it from people who try to say, you don't belong here, um, like get out, stay out and um, stay down. So I think um, at least from a like symbolic level that I, I definitely see that happening in, I know Kyrgyzstan best, um, but in Kazakhstan as well. And I, I, I think that in the next year, there'll be really, really exciting art and music and politics coming out of that space. Thank you. I, I see that Feruza has her hand raised, but before getting to Feruza, I'd just like to make sure that Dina does not have anything she'd like to add on that score or, or Mahira as well. Yeah, I, I would, yeah, if I can quickly. Yeah, so, yeah. so my point about the Soviet heritage also applies to other heritage. Mm -hmm. And also it, it's about exactly what Colleen was saying, it's about reclaiming, because human rights uh, actually does not, uh, like the, the West doesn't hold monopoly over human rights. Um, and actually, if we look at history, of uh, you know uh, human rights norms and the international conventions, it was actually always the global South that were pushing for these norms to be adopted, um, and uh, actually a lot of the Western states were opposed to these norms, um, and uh, yeah, so uh, similarly. Uh, you know homophobia is not inherent in Islam or in uh, you know uh, in uh, the Eastern culture. On the contrary, a lot of the homophobic norms and beliefs and uh, institutions were introduced uh, in the colonial encounter, right? All these laws that actually, for instance, criminalize homosexuality, uh, they are uh, the Western heritage. Um, so it's it's uh, it, it, that's kind of the idea that I was I was trying to put across. Thank you. Moving over to Dina. Я насчет женщин, которые подвергаются насилию, женщин с инвалидностью, как это отражено в нашем законодательстве. К сожалению, очень мало эффективных инструментов, чтобы защитить именно женщин и детей, имеющих, имеющих инвалидность. Женщин, вообще в целом людей. Да? И сейчас, когда мы рассматриваем два новых законодательства, это закон о правах ребенка и закон о о противодействии семейно-бытовому насилию, мы попросили внести туда нормы о том, чтобы это было отдельным квалифицирующим фактором, как насилие в отношении человека с инвалидностью, чтобы это было уже отягчающим обстоятельством. Но то же самое это касается детей. Я думаю, что эту поправку приму в парламенте. Thank you, Dina. Фаруза Арипова, floor is yours. So if you could unmute Hi. yourself, there you go. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Thank you so much uh, for this wonderful and very fruitful discussion. And I hope that we'll have more events of this sort in the future. I had uh, more of a comment actually going back to Anwar and uh, the embassies in the age of Trump actually standing in solidarity in Uzbekistan this past June. Uh, they posted a video uh, of a queer artist from Texas, Gina Chavez, who performed previously in uh, the local folk festival, Shark Taronalare. And she, um, they posted a video of her where at the end she basically says, this is a picture of me and my wife and happy pride to everyone. This was posted on the Facebook page uh, of the U.S. Embassy this past June. Uh, of course, as you can imagine, the post went viral. And Gina, in her, in her words, said uh, that her gayness, quote unquote, broke Uzbekistan. 
And there were multiple, multiple um, pandemic posts to the U.S. Embassy, basically that they, they should take it down. Uh, and the post is still there. And moreover, actually, the ambassador on his private Facebook page uh, said that, you know, posts of that sort actually generated more discussions that we actually need. Um, so, yeah, despite Trump, despite everything else, actually, you see sort of these kind of acts of defiance. Um, whatever they mean, I still don't know what exactly was the point of the U.S. Embassy to post that particular um, po uh, post of Gina's, but um, it did generate a lot of discussion. And also Gina herself received a lot of comments from the queer Uzbeks who thanked her for basically publicly coming out and you know expressing solidarity. Um, and then I had a question to Mahira and Colleen and Dina, if you know anything about, is there any statistics of the hate crimes that were committed on the grounds of homophobia? Um, do we know anything about it? Thank you so much. Uh, perhaps, Mahira, you can start off with this. Um, no, there are no statistics because uh, LGBTQ people are not uh, a protected category and there is no anti-discrimination law and uh, nobody keeps the statistics. The LGBTQ organizations uh, record and document cases of violence and crimes, hate crimes against LGBTQ people. Uh, but again, like this is a uh, very limited, uh, so we, uh, yeah. Okay, Dina, would you like to? Да, у нас, да, у нас тоже, к сожалению, официальной статистики нет по данным вопросам, но у нас существует организация, которая называется Феминита, и э, эта организация ведет активную работу, защищает права людей э, ЛГБТ сообщества. И э, есть, конечно, фиксируются факты. У нас в прошлом году был настоящий всплеск самоубийств э, людей из сообщества ЛГБТ, потому что на почве травли, на почве э, каминаутов, которые совершали молодые люди, И вот здесь была приведена статистика, я, к сожалению, не смогу сейчас ее назвать, но она велась вот именно этим сообществом. И в прошлом году у нас был очень тяжелый кейс по сексуальному насилию над молодым человеком, которого в жестокой форме изнасиловали люди традиционной ориентации только потому, что он из гей-сообщества. То есть, ну, ну, это буквально было на почве ненависти преступления, их осудили, им дали сроки, но сроки не соответствовали э, тому преступлению, которое они совершили. Им э, двум мужчинам дали минимальные сроки по этому преступлению. Но э, надо сказать, что вот этот герой, как говорится, этого происшествия, Айян, он вышел публично, он заявил о своем изнасиловании открыто, его в подробностях обсуждали во всех СМИ, и это было таким серьезным уроком для общества, потому что Наше сообщество разделилось, как говорится, на две категории, и оказалось очень много людей, которые поддержали его, независимо от своей ориентации сексуальной. Well, I don't have any more questions at the moment, uh, but we still have a few more minutes, and I would like to ask each of the panelists, um, how do you see the prospects for gender equality and greater LGBT plus rights developing in Central Asia? Colleen has already told us that she thinks this next year we'll be seeing some very interesting events, but at the same time, and I know, Colleen, you've done some excellent reporting on the backlash that we've experienced from these events. Um, so I would like to gauge from, from each of you how you see uh, the near future um, in, with regards to these questions. And perhaps we'll start with Colleen then. Yeah, I think, uh you know, it's difficult to pre predict the future and any uh, social scientist is really, um, I guess, not keen to um, try to predict out moving forward. But um, I guess one thing that has to be taken into consideration in trying to gauge what the potential success or what sorts of um, shifts or movements we might see in policy really comes down to the pandemic and the uneven impact uh, across gender that I think Recent research has shown that um, the health impact of COVID has been uneven between men and women. The economic impact of both losing jobs, losing access to income, being able to get access to emergency support from the state, that this also is uneven across genders. 
And I think what this does is that as women are, who maybe normally in their spare time might have been organizing, might have been um, gathering, might have been writing letters to the government, now are scrambling to take care of themselves and their families. Um, and I just think that I, I see the potential for a lot of creative um, and persuasive campaigns that are taking place online. I think that it's not fair to completely discount what's happening on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook. But at the same time, I think that the, the economic challenges and political challenges that are being uh, reinforced and entrenched by the pandemic are going to make it a little bit more difficult um, in the next months and year moving forward to, to translate that. Um, that would be what I would guess. Thank you, Colleen. Dina. В Казахстане намечается достаточно серьезный прогресс в области гендерных прав, потому что консолидировалось огромное количество женских правозащитных организаций. Мы выходим на новый уровень борьбы, мы демонстрируем серьезные результаты в этом направлении. И у нас для нас, в принципе, сейчас открывают дороги как в парламент, как в правительство. Сейчас появились женщины в управлении страной. Да, это, конечно, оптимистический прогноз, но здесь еще предстоит большая работа именно с регионами, с отдаленными селами, аулами, где проживают люди в меньшей степени образованные в этих вопросах, но правительство в этом плане нас поддерживает. Вопрос о ЛГБТ-сообществе. Там тоже, ну, как бы вот по сравнению с прошлыми годами, намного лучше сейчас ситуация обстоит. Я знаю, что несколько лет женщины не могли добиться элементарно регистрации движения общественного, общественной организации в органах юстиции. И в этом году впервые вот было зарегистрировано первое официальная ЛГБТ э, неправительственная организация. Э, наши представители сообщества ЛГБТ выходят на международный э, уровень, выходят с международными докладами и э, постоянно идет просвещение по Казахстану. Даже выезжают в небольшие села, потом предоставляют отчеты. Конечно, работа еще должна быть большая. Мы видим сопротивление как со стороны еще и самого сообщества, и даже лично я подвергалась неоднократным заявлениям со стороны мужского сообщества о том, что я в полицию на меня заявляли о том, что я якобы дискриминирую права мужчин и пишу о них не очень хорошо, на меня обижаются. И вот буквально на днях появилось уже новое заявление в полицию. Но мы как-то с этим справляемся, потому что ну, мы действительно заявляем о своих правах вот так вот сильно, громко. И я рада тому, что вот не молчи движение, оно так спонтанно рождается сейчас практически в каждом регионе Центральной Азии. Есть представительство, не представительство, а организация не молчи, которая сама объединилась. Это Узбекистан, это Таджикистан, это Туркмения, это даже сейчас в Эстонии есть не молчи, в Украине не молчи. И то есть мы растем, я думаю, что как раз объединение женских сил и придаст нам как бы, больше возможностей. Спасибо. Дима, um, Дина, before moving on to Mahira, uh, you did mention in your original uh, presentation that there was some resistance to the bill to counteract domestic violence. And since we're looking a bit towards the future here, I'm just wondering if it's at all possible for you to gauge how big that resistance is, or do you think you'll, you'll have success in the end with this bill? В первую очередь сопротивление идет со стороны э, правительства, потому что в основном даже не потому, что женщины претендуют на свои права, а они мотивируют это тем, что это бюджетно затратно, и те нормы, которые мы просим продвигать, они требуют больших финансовых вложений. Но если посмотреть на политику распределения грантов и финансирования на борьбу с насилием, то мы увидим, что в Казахстане вкладывают очень большие деньги в эту работу, но она не консолидирована, она не организована каким-то одним институтом, и все идет в разброс, и многие организации просто дублируют деятельность друг друга, и поэтому мы хотим создать единый институт, который бы, ну вот, объединяющий всех орган, который будет иметь а, право именно участвовать 
ну, скажем, исполнительный характер будут иметь и объединят вокруг себя все госструктуры. Вот против этого идет серьезное сопротивление, потому что все борются за свою территорию, за свое финансирование, каждое, каждое министерство. Okay, thank you. Mohira, your, your final thoughts. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I would agree with uh, Colleen in uh, that it's hard to predict uh, the full impact of uh, the COVID pandemic on, uh, you know, gender dynamics in the region. We've already seen, uh, as was already uh, talked about, the increase in domestic violence, uh, dramatic uh, for LGBTQ community that also you know, uh, uh, for instance, during the lockdown uh, period, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, LGBTQ people were uh, forced to stay at home with uh, abusive relatives. Uh, they uh, may have lost, they, they may, many lost jobs uh, or, yeah, couldn't, um, uh, couldn't even buy food. So uh, there was a kind of a, um, one of the uh, things uh, that uh, happened uh, was that uh, LGBTQ organizations uh, mobilized and uh, uh, provided direct um, material support uh, to those in need and uh, uh, extra shelters were organized uh, and the same for um, for women yeah so uh, the women's organizations or all, all those crisis centers who never get any support from the government uh, demands were actually being made on them during this crisis uh, to provide this uh, service that they've been uh, providing for years without any support and um, and, and uh, yeah so the, it, it is uh, clear that women and uh, other vulnerable groups marginalized groups are uh, affected disproportionately. And uh, as I mentioned, when, when this uh, balance of power shifts, yeah, uh, that also uh, probably mean um, even further uh, assault on our uh, liberties, on our ability to organize and mobilize the communities and simply to survive. Yeah, for a lot of, for, for a lot of people, it's, it's a matter of survival. Um, so uh, I, not overly optimistic, uh, but I also see uh, uh, opportunities, right? Every crisis is a threat, but also an opportunity. So, uh, for instance, uh, we've learned uh, how to organize and connect with people uh, working online these days. And I see a lot of new connections happening that were not happening before. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll come up with new and uh, creative strategies of doing activism in these times. All right, thank you, Mahira. Well, we, we've run out of time, although we still have a few more questions, but uh, Laila Islamova does want to thank Dina for all of the efforts that she does for everyone in Kazakhstan. For, so that, that is to Dina. And also it's worth noting that Matt Yusevich uh, has a bit of information on the situation in Uzbekistan that due to COVID, many Uzbek queers who were living in Kazakhstan and Russia and other countries had to return to Uzbekistan. Their names were disclosed in telegram groups spreading anti-gay sentiments and calling for purifying Uzbekistan from LGBTQI plus people. So the number of cases, is, uh, hate crimes that is, is soaring in Uzbekistan. All right, well, thank you to all of you very much. I think this has been a, a fantastic uh, initial discussion on this subject and we, and we hope to return to it. Um, thank, you, thank you once again, everybody, our panelists, um, those who've joined us. Have a good rest of the day and see you again soon. Thank you very much.